And the last thing I want to say on this is that even if it's lawful to exclude undocumented from these services, the analysis around the country is showing that issues of costs are playing a very important role in, on lawmakers making decisions on this. Uh, Colorado, as you know, in, 19, in 2006 passed a very important omnibus bill banning undocumented from a number of public uh, benefits. And analysis, they, did anal they asked 14 of the departments to see how much money they had spent just executing these new provisions and how much money had they saved by barring undocumented from this access. And it was actually hands down. They almost saved nothing and they had spent two million bucks just implementing new procedures for, for making sure that undocumented were screened. So the issue here is there's an assumption among a lot of lawmakers that undocumented people access these services. I think most people who know undocumented know they don't access these services. The last thing they want to do is be caught in a situation where their status will come to notice and they will come into the hands of federal authorities. So I think issue on the straight issues of cost-benefit analysis on this is an important public policy concern which I think uh, people should be aware of when they, even to, when they talk about uh, the ban on, uh, on the undocumented for, for the access. Let me stop there and see if I can answer any questions. Thank you uh, both very much. Uh, we will have uh, about uh, half an hour, I think, for uh, questions uh, from uh, the various members of the committee. I'm going to defer my questions and see if there's uh, anyone else who might want to begin. Um, I am familiar with many of the uh, legal authorities that you have cited, although I don't, don't claim to have uh, studied them in, in anywhere near the detail you have. But I had one question, including, by the way, the OLC memo and the debate over it, which is quite quite interesting. Um, one question, though, is over your um, statement that a detention uh, can't exceed the um, duration that it would otherwise um, uh, take if uh, the uh, there's reason to uh, be, let, let's say the situation is a local official has reason to, to arrest someone uh, for a local offense, uh, checks the immigration status, um, notifies the, the INS, and the INS says, please detain that person until uh, we can pick them up. Let's, let's assume the, that it's a re-entry um, violation, and there's no MOU. Um, it seems to me that all the states have signed with the federal government the uh, international compact or this, the, um, I should say, the uh, interstate compact on detainers. Doesn't that um, either allow or possibly require under the terms of the compact that a detention might exceed the, not that I'm advocating again yeah, right, uh, yeah, right now understand. that they should, should do that, but isn't that? I think, I think especially with respect to the, to the crime that you mentioned, which is 276, which is protected by the, by the INA, I think if it's, it's a very different analysis, I think, when the federal government then requests you to detain someone. I think there the, the police may be obliged, actually, to keep the person as long for the federal government to then come. But again, it's limited in the context of the underlying uh, crime for which that person is being detained is 270, 276, which Congress has specifically authorized, and two, that the request then comes from a federal agency to hold that person. I think that probably would be, would be fine under the compact. It's with respect to crimes that are not covered and where the local cops themselves decide to detain a person I think those are the areas which are problematic. Well, like any law professor, I was going to begin with the easy and just get maybe one more to the slightly harder, and that is any any other criminal um, penalty where, um, and and let's say even the um, it's the county policy to to inquire in the INS database, and then um, contact uh, the federal officials and ask if they want to uh, pick them up. Wouldn't uh, the compact possibly either authorize or require uh, not in the, the not in the absence of a of, in my listen there are obviously uh, legal authorities on the side side not in my opinion my in my opinion I think if there was a there was a there was a criminal arrest warrant which 
if the person gets into okay. the NCIC, which okay. is, I think, what you're talking yes. about. And in the NCIC, this is the National Crime Information Center database, if the NCIC shows a criminal warrant against the person, then I think most people believe that you would have the right to detain the person. If the, if the NCIC does not show a criminal warrant, then you wouldn't have the right to detain the person. In fact, I think police chiefs have been clear on this, that when you see a warrant flashing across the NCIC database, that itself does not, just the fact that you see warrant doesn't give you the authority to detain the person. Then be more, more careful in analyzing the warrant further to see whether it's a civil violation of immigration law or a criminal. If it's a civil violation, don't hold the person. If it's a criminal violation, you may get the right to hold the person. So that, I think, is, an, is the distinction. Okay, thank you. Do you have another question? Or, uh, Ed? <laughs> 